Hello, this is Tyler Crone with the 36th District Democrats. We are so excited this afternoon to welcome Salvador Mungia, who is running for the Supreme Court. Welcome to you, Sal. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, let me just start off by saying a little bit about myself. I'm in my 40th year of practicing law, my 38th year in private practice. I was born and raised in Tacoma, the son of immigrants, and I saw how my parents were mistreated when I was very young, and that's what drove me to law, to be able to stand up for myself and my family. And since becoming a lawyer, I learned that I could stand up for others, and I love doing that. Done pro bono work throughout my career, representing those incarcerated in jail or those in the Northwest Detention Center, all the way down to just representing individuals who were less than $1,000 because they have had that taken away from them by someone who has power and they don't have any power. Uh, I love being a lawyer. I have been the president of my watch of the Washington State Bar Association, of the local bar association. I've held leadership posts in access to justice organizations. Finally, I love the fact that I think those who share my values have been endorsing me. Uh, so I'm endorsed by over 90 judges throughout the state. I'm endorsed by six of the nine current sitting Supreme Court justices, four retired Supreme Court justices. So those who are doing this work are saying Sal should be the guy. And then endorsed by you know Jay Inslee, Danny Heck, Mike Pellicciotti, uh, Bob Ferguson, Lori Jenkins. I think we're over 50 uh, political endorsements, which I love because it just shares that. I mean, these are people actually know me for the most part. Some I'm just meeting now. But uh, I think we share our values, which which I love. And I'm so grateful for their support. Thank you. We provided you questions in advance, and we'd love to provide you the opportunity now to pick up whichever one I believe they are in the chat, if you can see them. And you could tell us which is the which is one that you would like to uh, to answer for us. Now, I'll pick on the access to justice, although if I get a chance, I'd like to address the racism as well. Uh, but the access to justice, again, I've been involved with promoting access to justice since 1992. And if you will, I've been doing pro bono work since 1986. So in that sense, promoting access to justice, but maybe a little more formally uh, serving on a newly uh, formed organizational board called Legal Aid for Washington, which is now the Campaign for Equal Justice. I served on that board for 10 years, uh, was the president for two years. And that organizations, uh, which was like one of the first in the country, we raised money from the legal community to help fund civil legal aid. I've served six years on the Endowment for Equal Justice Board, um, the only endowment uh, throughout the country supporting civil legal aid. And now we've gotten the endowment to the size where we're donating over $1 million a year to civil legal aid funding. I served on the Access to Justice Board for six years, was chair of that board for two years. You know, I've gone down to Olympia uh, to lobby our state lawmakers to increase funding for civil legal aid. I've gone to Washington, D.C. to lobby our federal delegation to increase funding for civil legal aid. That's the run-up to what can a judge do. That is one of the reasons that I am running for this position. I'm hoping to make a bigger impact. I always thought, you know, until last year when I was asked to do this, um, that I would keep on doing what I'm doing as a lawyer. Um, but I also know, because you know, I've got friends up at the state Supreme Court, especially Steve Gonzalez, Mary Yu, and seeing what they've been able to do because of their position. And I thought, man, you know, that time has passed me by. Uh, I'm going to keep on doing this as a lawyer. But when I was asked last year, thought about it, I said, yes, I will do it because it gives me this opportunity. You have more of an impact going to the state legislature. You have more of an impact going back to Washington, D.C., talking with lawmakers simply because you are a justice on the Supreme Court. You have more of an impact going on the legal community, which I have done um, as a lawyer, especially as bar president, telling lawyers about the importance of doing pro bono work and to providing funding for civil legal aid. So the only difference will be um, that I can't ask for money either as a judicial candidate now or if I get elected this position as a judge. I can't make that pitch, which I kind of regret. I mean, I won't, I mean, I try not to brag, but shoot, people think I do a good job. I've been asked, 
to go up to Seattle, to Bellingham, you know, different organizations to make the ask. Uh, and I used to have law partners ask me, Sal, can't somebody else do that? And I said, well, maybe, but I love doing it um, because I'm not asking for money for myself. I'm asking for help for those who don't have a voice, who those who don't have the power to be able to hire an attorney. Um, so I see that as a justice. Thank you. So the, the next piece that perhaps you could give us some of your perspectives on is around racism and implicit bias may intrude into trial court proceedings. How will you identify and address racism and implicit bias in rulings and verdicts that you will review as a Supreme Court judge? And what is you know, kind of embedded in that, a bias, if you could share with us that you have had, um, that you have had and that you have gone about unlearning or or thinking about holding in your analysis. So if you could speak to that kind of nexus of questions, we would be so grateful. Thank you. You know, I love those questions only because when I've read them, I thought these are the wrong questions. Okay. And, <laughs> and I know I'm pretty in trouble. I'm probably going to lose any chance I have of getting the endorsement. But, you know, when the question says, Racism and implied bias may intrude into the trial court proceedings. My view of the world is it does. There's no may about it. And I've certainly got a lot of sociological studies which show that, you know, when, and I've talked about racism, I've talked about bias within the legal system. Um, again, that's something that's been a dear value of mine and something that I've been trying to address or I have been addressing throughout my legal career. But I'll just give you one small example. There was a study out of Multnomah County, which we all know that's where Portland is, is based. Uh, so not a, you know, you would think of more of a liberal progressive sort of uh, site to study this. And they looked at jury awards in civil damage cases and personal injury cases and uh, to see what the effect was if you have a plaintiff who was a person of color, color as opposed to a plaintiff who was white. And what the study showed was on what's called special damages. In other words, medical bills, lost wages, loss of future earnings. The awards were the same for the similar type of, of damages. Right? So they're comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Where they found the difference, though, and I, I talked about this, I talk about this, especially with people who are doing this work, because you have to know about it if you're going to effectively represent your clients, if you're representing people of color like I do. Um, and that is on the if you will, general damages, pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, disability. People of color for similar types of injuries were awarded 60 cents on the dollar of what white plaintiffs were being awarded. And that's just reality. And anybody who does this type of work has to know about it. So when you, the question says, may, no, it, it does. And, and the reason is implicit bias is integral to a whole society. It's almost like, you know, well, how will you see bias? You don't see implicit bias. It's almost like the threat, the individual threads in, in my sports code. You can't see the individual threats. They're all woven through there. That's the way implicit bias is. And the whole definition of implicit bias is it's unconscious. You don't know that you have that bias. Uh, anybody who's done the IAT test, implicit association test, uh, will know that, that we all have those implicit biases. So the other question was, you know, how have you, in effect, cured yourself of, of a bias? I don't think you ever cure yourself of a bias. I think at least in my case, you know, and I tell people, you know, as you can tell, shoot, I'm a brown guy. My mom came from Japan, my dad from Mexico. I saw how they were mistreated, right? How they were the subjects of racism and bias. And yet I will tell you, those are the two most racist people that I knew, right? <laughs> and their views certainly infected me in my views growing up. Mm. And yes, did I have to deal with them? Do I still have to deal with them? Yes, doesn't mean I act out in them, but certainly those thoughts creep up in my head. And, and when I talk about this, I, I love giving this example because um, uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson gives it, which is like, you know, there's a lot of street cred there. But he starts off when he talks about racism and bias. He goes, you know, one day I'm, I'm walking in downtown Chicago on the sidewalk. Uh, it's getting a little late at night. And suddenly I hear a bunch of footsteps running towards my way. And I turn around. And I relax because it's just a bunch of white guys. 
And he gives that example. I love that. Okay. Mm. We all have these biases. We've all grown up with them. And if you take, again, the IAT test, you will see that. Um, so it's something that we all have to be aware of. I've spoken out and tried to educate people on this because just because you have this bias doesn't mean you have to act upon it. I think the more educated you are about these biases, the less likely that you will act on it. So again, I'm hoping with Thank my you. position. Okay. Sorry. No, no, no. You, you've, you've made a great case. I'm going to um, ask Alex to ask you question number four to skip down the line, which is uh, a point that is very important to one of our eboard members, Pat McGaw. So I will ask Alex to ask you that question, and then we'll go into a more free form where the eboard members, if there are any follow-up points they want to ask you, or if there's anything else you wish to share. So Alex? Yes, thank you. And I'm more than happy to ask this question. Uh, what is your position on revising prior Washington Supreme Court precedents, especially precedents that are from decades ago when our state was very, very different? Yep. And in fact, I read the Chase decision uh, before uh, this meeting here. So here are my views, all right? And let me start the very baseline kind of guiding principle of judges. We're not there to give our views. You want that, you elect state legislators, you elect your executive officers. That's not what judges are there for, to do. They're there to make sure that any laws enacted by legislators, in fact, don't violate either the federal constitution or the state constitution. So that's baseline number one. Two, my views, precedent should not be reversed easily, right? Um, and, and again, you don't want, just because certain individuals are holding those positions, that those individuals get a flip the law to how they want it to be. I mean, there's a reason that we try to have precedent and we try to you know, really respect prior rulings and really respect as a judicial uh, philosophy. Uh, one of the <laughs> principles when you're looking at statutes is you try to uphold them. You try not to find constitutional violations. And again, that's the separation of uh, powers. It's the checks and balances, but you have to respect the other two branches uh, as a judge. So what I've been telling people, and I, I've read this decision, I, you know, and again, uh, you know, I could take the easy way out and say, well, look, and, and I will take it a little bit easy way out. You know, these kind of questions come before the state Supreme Court, not infrequently. And I can't give opinions on how I would rule on something coming before the court. I will say this um, again, knowing that you know my values is you know I'm not going to be one that's going to reverse precedent, um, just because it may I may disagree with how I would have analyzed it, especially the older the president. Where that lessens for me um, is if that prior ruling is based upon sexism homophobia, ableism, uh, you know, where the, the foundation, if you will, of that opinion has rotten roots. Uh, and then it will give it a far less deference. Where it's here uh, in this Chase opinion, where it's, if you will, an economic decision, the way that it was interpreted, I would, and again, I, I don't want to forget about Chase, uh, because I don't want to say how it would rule. And again, each opinion each factual situation is different but you saw even the court there at least the way that i read the opinion in a way struggling with it saying look at um we think this is the way that the stat the constitution was written we've got to follow it there was a dissent uh grant you that uh, the lone dissent saying no we don't have to do that i haven't read the briefs and you know one thing that any court <laughs> We, we were citing it as an example, but not no one who is going to be watching. Very few of the folks who are watching this video are going to understand at that level. So um, thank you, Sal. I'm going to I'm going to jump in so that we can ask you some follow up points, because it's it's going to a level that even myself as a law school grad is is is, yeah, being left okay. behind. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's good. It's great. I, we, I love it. I love it. But let me pause um, to see if any of our board wants to ask you a follow-up point. I will see. And I see Amanda's hand. Over to you, Amanda. Yeah, I'd love to ask a question uh, just on the follow-up on the, the bias question. I think you make a good point about eradicating one's bias and that not, not necessarily being a good standard. But I do think um, I, I, would, I would be interested to hear about 
a bias that you yourself have um, realized that you had? And how do you compensate for that and ensure that that doesn't impact how you rule and how you do your job? Okay. Well, I think an easy answer for me on that one is, uh, you know, really gender bias. I was raised in a society and in a family where women were expected to serve men where, you know, my brother, my older brother would always say, yeah, whatever a woman can do, a man could do better. You know, I mean, those thoughts were in my head. That's the way I was raised up. That's the way that I thought. I will tell you, those thoughts started changing. And that's why I love a liberal arts education. When I went to PLU and my world opened up. Now, where my my caution is, and I, I can give you a lot of examples. And, and I, I can tell because Tyler will tell me I'm going too much into the woods on this stuff. Um, but I'm always watching myself. I am always constantly watching myself. I went down to uh, Newport Beach. I spoke at this national conference where high level litigators came in, right? Um, but, you know, as I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm watching them come in, okay, old white my guy, old white guy, old white guy, oh, old white woman, old white woman, but mostly a bunch of old white guys. I think there are three lawyers of color there. I was one of them. And the group was a little over 100. But what struck me was, uh, on a speaker before me, how he would always use the, the pronoun he or him when referring to a judge, referring to a lawyer. The only time he would use her or she is if it's a victim, uh, you know, a generic victim or a legal assistant. And man, I'm just in there and I'm thinking, does anybody else see this? So I asked him whether, because where's a break for it went, went up and I said, you know, John, do you mind if I use what you says? Like, you know, in my talk, he said, oh, no, Sal, because I think he thought I was going to do something flattering. Um, but then when I started talking, I said, you know, did anybody notice when John was up here that every time that he referred to a judge in the abstract, the, the pronoun was always he or him. And you should, all the women were going like this, but all the men were just clueless. So I'm always on the lookout, uh, Amanda. I'm always just trying to check myself again. I think we have these biases. And what, what scares me with implicit bias is, am I missing something, right? Am I missing something? So I don't think I'm ever cured. I'm always on the lookout. Thank you. Laura Marie, you're going to get the last word. Thank you. And my question actually goes in with what you're talking about. So if we're considering the equity and education throughout our country and specifically our state, how can you or us as a group encourage or increase access for more diverse students to go into the law? Uh, okay, uh, here's one thing that I started doing, and this is really the long game, uh, but to me it's an important game. And it has so many different benefits in addition to what you're talking about. Um, but eight years ago, I started up a program through my law firm, and I'm trying to give you the short version where we adopted uh, the first grade class at Sheridan Elementary, which is on the east side of Tacoma, which the east side has nothing. All right. It's one of those parts, the cities that we saw when they put in the interstate freeways that cut off um, the poor section of town from the more affluent section of town. 70% of the kids that are kids of color. They are kids that are eligible for free or reduced uh, school lunches. 10% of the kids come from homes without a home. They're homeless uh, families. Um, and so we've been working with these kids and we followed them up through each year. But one of my goals, I'm trying to give you the shorter version, was to get women role models and people of color role models before them because I knew they weren't getting enough of that. And let me tell you, we brought them all to our office uh, when they were in first grade. So we had 81 of them. It was great. Uh, I had the mayor, uh, who's now uh, our congresswoman, Marilyn Strickland, you know, from the 10th. But she was our mayor at that time, and, and I happened to know her. I, I asked her whether she'd come and give the kids a talk, because I was, uh, again, having a great role model. Um, but what was cool about that was um, at the end of that first couple of weeks of school, when they were there, I was talking to the principal, and she said, you know, Sal, we always do these kind of drawings by the kids. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be. And, uh, you know, they'd be police officer, firefighter, soccer player, whatever. And she showed me one of the drawings, a little girl drawing is, when I grow up, I want to be a lawyer. And that to me is one of the places we have to start. Mm -hmm. Almost getting ourselves in front of kids, a lot of other things, but that's one of the things to really get that pipeline going. 
And that's what we all can do. And it doesn't take any more tax dollars. It just takes all of us giving some of our time. And let me tell you, when I go there, I always tell people, that's the best part of my week. Those, those kids are the greatest. Thank you so much, Sal, for being with us. That's the end of our formal interview with you. And uh, it has been a delight to have you this afternoon. I think we have all enjoyed listening to you tremendously.